All right, it's a few minutes after 7.30 now. So I think we can go ahead and begin. So first off, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, it's evening here on the East Coast, but morning where our presenter is right now. So we are looking forward to seeing all of you at the Energy Finance Training Conference coming up in just a couple of weeks now in New York. And um, we appreciate you taking the time out today. Before we begin, I just want to go through a couple housekeeping things. The first is that, again, my name is Jessica Studney, and I'm the Media Relations Manager here at IEFA. And you will see that my name is listed as our Executive Director, Sandy Buchanan. Um, so if you need to reach me, um, please feel free to do so through the chat section on the right-hand side of your GoToMeeting bar. Um, questions are welcome. Please feel free to send them to me through the message uh, chat section. And what we'll do is I'll reserve all of those till the end of the presentation, and then we will go through them one by one. Another thing is to um, please put your phones on mute. I think uh, everybody might have already done that so far. It sounds a little quiet out there. And then finally, um, you will have access to the presentation uh, that we're going through during the webinar. We'll have it posted online on AIFA's site um, in the coming day or so following this webinar. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Yolanda Chung. She's an energy finance consultant with us, and the topic of her presentation is Understanding Project Finance for Coal-Powered Transactions. Hello, everyone. So I expect all of you have um, are able to see my screen now and see the presentation. If anyone's having any issues, please let us know. So today we're going to talk about project finance. Um, thank you very much for finding the time to dial in to listen to this. Project finance is a widely used financing mechanism to finance a variety of infrastructure projects. And today we're going to talk about project finance specifically for coal power transactions. What is it that is so special that many coal power transactions have used this means of financing in order to get built? We'll be talking about the basics, the fundamentals of project finance, and I'll introduce a few key words, terms, and phrases that you'll hear a lot and read about when you analyze project finance transactions. Then I'm going to talk about the individual players in the transaction, the lenders, export credit agencies, and the project developers, project sponsors. Project finance is, by definition, is the financing of long-term infrastructure based upon a non-recourse structure. The key word here is non-recourse. Now, what that means is that the lender, the bank, that is lending money towards the project is only entitled to repayment from the profits of the project the loan is funding and not from assets of the borrower. So if I were the borrower, say for example, and I have a hydropower business already, but now I want to get into coal-fired power, I go to the bank and I ask for a project finance loan then the bank would not be able to tap into the revenue I generate from my hydropower business. The only way the bank is going to get paid under this project finance structure is that this coal fire power plant that I intend to build eventually is able to generate enough money to repay the loan. That's the main difference. That means it's non-recourse. The bank has no recourse to the money I generate from other parts of my business. And that's why every aspect of a project finance project has to be bankable. Bankable is to describe that lenders have to be confident that all the risks have to be covered because the repayment is entirely dependent on the viability of the project. Because infrastructure is so expensive to build, the duration or the tenor of the loan 
is very long. It could be 15 years, 20 years, or more. I know I say that the key word here is non-recourse when it comes to project finance. In reality, though, truly non-recourse project finance deals are very rare. Most of the time, in practice, is actually limited recourse. And that's something you read when you read about project finance transactions, limited recourse. And that means the bank, under certain circumstances, could ask me, the project developer, to use my other revenue to repay the loan. But it's limited in what they can ask me to do. And that's why for organizations such as an NGO or any energy analyst, when you're analyzing a project finance transaction, just because it's project finance, just because it's non-recourse, doesn't mean that you can disregard the financial strength of the project developer and the depth of their pockets. It is still important. Another key term about project finance is risk allocation. Project finance is about identifying each risk associated with the design, construction, operation of the project and determining which participant in the transaction is best able to bear that risk and you work out the mechanic to do so. An example is, I'm going to build a coal-fired power plant, the main risk is completion risk because we don't know for sure can the project be completed on budget and on time. That's a huge risk. And when construction costs and overruns do arise, the lenders are not expected to advance additional funds. They're not going to lend any additional money towards the project. Then what do we do? We try to mitigate and manage this risk by having the project developer enter into a turnkey construction contract, meaning that in exchange for a fixed price, the contractor agrees to construct the project by a specific date and in accordance to all the things that they've agreed to do in the first place. So in terms of risk allocation, now completion risk has been allocated to the contractor. It's not borne by the banks, it's not borne by the project sponsors. And there are dozens of risks like this that the banks have to check off and find someone to bear that risk before you could achieve financial close. Another key term here, a lot of the times we hear NGOs saying we want to make known our challenges to a coal-fired power plant uh, being planned to build, we want to make known our complaints before financial close. It's a very important watershed. And you also hear it from the banks saying, oh, you know, we have to check off all the things that we have to do, all the conditions before achieving financial close. Our year-end bonus is dependent on this. Financial close is the date of the initial drawdown. Drawdown is the transfer of the funds, of the money coming from the lender to the project to start implementing it. And financial close can only occur when all the condition precedents are met. Condition precedents is just a fancier way of saying the things that you need to do before financial close. And these conditions usually are permitting planning approvals and another important issue for um, coal-fired power plants is land acquisition. Many governments tendering out projects for coal power and the lenders lending money towards coal power projects, they would expect project sponsors to acquire most, if not all, of the land needed for the plant site and for the transmission line to connect the plant to the nearest substation. And they generally would expect this land to be obtained and you have to demonstrate that you've secured appropriate legal rights over that land. So land acquisition being a very prominent condition precedent, very often stumble, really scooper 
a transaction and delay financial close at the very least. And also as a result, you see that NGOs very often work with communities on land issues and is a very powerful way to show that the power plant may not secure financial close if this particular issue is not resolved. A quick summing up, the key difference between project finance and a corporate loan. So I were the developer, I have my hydropower business, but if I were to go to the bank and I ask the bank for a corporate loan, then the bank would have recourse and they allow to tap into the revenue I generate from my hydropower business. Even though I told the bank I want to borrow a billion, but that billion dollars is only going to be used for the coal-fired power plant that I want to build. Regardless of that, the bank in a corporate loan structure would be able to ask me to sell off all my other assets, hydropower, etc., to repay that loan. In project finance, it's the very opposite. In fact, officially, the borrower is a special purpose vehicle, SPV, and the lender is only allowed to use the cash flow generated by the project to repay the loan. And that's why project finance is sometimes also called cash flow lending. Over the years, project finance has really evolved. Um, a few notable trends that we've observed. Project finance has become a lot, a lot more complex. The, the conditions precedents have become a lot longer. And it also takes a lot longer to close a deal these days, especially for a controversial project such as coal-fired power sector. One very notable trend in project finance for coal-fired power is that European and North American banks have retrenched from financing coal-fired power projects. They've really left a gap. But that gap has been more than enough filled by local banks and also by regional banks. You see banks headquartered in Malaysia, in Singapore, they're lending towards coal power projects in the region, in Southeast Asia. And you see also export credit agencies, ECAs, they have also stepped in to fill this gap and they have been lending directly to projects a lot more. You also see that now project finance is usually a club deal. Before the financial crisis in 2008, most project finance deals you would see will be funded by a bank and it's got the resources to underwrite the entirety of the debt. And then it would parcel out the loan or syndicate the loan by selling smaller participations to other banks. Now that put a higher risk on the primary lender and post financial crisis you don't see this sort of underwriting syndicating model a lot anymore. What you have is a club deal, a number of banks coming together from the very beginning, they work on the transaction, they share the loan and the risk. Now this change um, is quite important for an outside observer like NGOs because project finance transactions take longer to close and with a club deal, project developers would have to deal with a larger number of banks, answer more questions, satisfy more credit processes and committees approvals. So it's harder to close the deal, basically. What I've shown on the screen now is um, a very standardized business flow for projects backed by an independent power producer, an IPP. It goes from pre-qualification to financial close to commercial operation date and then eventually end of contract. During the pre-qualification stage, a lot has happened already. So during this stage, um, 
project developers have come together, they form a consortium, and they would appoint a financial advisor. The financial advisor would be likely to be a, a, a bank, and the advisor would line up a number of potential lenders to the project. And at this point, and actually even going to the next stage for request pr proposal, the potential lenders are really just that. They potentially would lend to the project. Now, all these banks being lined up, they would have gone to their respective credit committee and say, do we have an intent to lend to this project? Looking at the very preliminary information at that stage. And they may say yes and say, okay, we'll, we'll express an interest to lend. But the banks are not officially uh, and they haven't officially got the approval from their credit committee, not at this stage. But when you read about project finance transactions, rumors in the media, very often you will hear the project developer saying, ah oh, yes, you know, which this bank, that bank, they've all agreed to lend me money. You will hear a lot of that rumors in the media. And the chances are the banks haven't actually sealed that approval. The implication is, again, for an outside observer, for NGOs, if there is any cause of concern that may make the bank think twice about lending to a coal fire power project, the earlier you get involved, the higher the chances and the he easier it is for the banks to pull out. Once they've got the official credit committee approval, it is a lot harder for the banks to pull out because that would really damage the client relationships. But if you catch them earlier enough, they will say, well, you know, we did consider it and express an indication to, to lend, but having fought twice because of other issues, we've decided not to. The earlier you can get in, the earlier you express your complaints and any cause for concern, to the banks, the easier it is for them to reconsider their lending. Pre-qualification is basically the process to qualify consortiums based on specific criteria. And they will be looking at the financial strength of the project sponsors and the technical capability track record of the sponsors. And we've covered a little bit what would happen at financial close Commercial operation date is the date when the power plant starts to operate commercially. And that's also when the project starts to generate revenue to start repaying the loan. What I've shown here now is a typical project finance structure chart. You'll see in the middle the borrower is the special purpose vehicle. It's just a project company, it has no previous business or record. The only activity of the project company is to carry out the project. The sponsors, project developers on the right, they put in equity. They invest into the SPV. In return, they expect to receive dividend as their return on, on their investment. Now the financial institutions or the lenders primarily on this side, they extend a loan to the SPV and they expect the loan to be repaid. The SPV would also farm out a number of contracts with counterparties, one for the engineering procurement construction, one for operation and maintenance, one for the coal supply, and then one very important to the off-taker which is the buyer of the electricity, the off-taker. Let's use one live example to illustrate this. In Indonesia, there is the deal Cherry Bond 1, a mega deal, 660 megawatt. When it's closed in March 2010, it's got a lot of media and NGO attention. The financing package, the loan, costs $595 million. In that case, the project sponsors are Marubeni, Korea Midland Power, and a couple of local companies. On this side, you are starting to see 
you can see a pattern here. So we've got Japanese and Korean sponsors. And who are the lenders? We've got the Japan Bank of International Cooperation, a Japan ECA. The Korea Export Import Bank, a Korean ECA. And a number of Japanese and international banks extending the project finance loan for this project. A second example, this time in Vietnam, an IPP project, Mong Duong 2. Big capacity, 1,200 megawatt. It's got financial close in September 2011. Again, really mega project, lending $1.5 billion towards the project. The project sponsors are AES, a US company, POSCO, a Korean company, and China Investment Corporation. On the left here, okay, so we know POSCO is involved, so it's not a surprise to see Korean Export Import Bank involved and a number of international banks lending towards the project. If you search for Mong Duong Tu, um, you will find there was a lot of speculation as to whether a Chinese ECA would be involved in this box, but they eventually didn't for whatever reasons. But that's really the pattern. You see where the sponsors are from, and then you will see who the lenders and the export credit agencies are involved. And sometimes the relationship is not just between the sponsors and the financial institutions on this side. It's also be between the counterparties here and the banks. So if we have a Korean engineering procurement construction contractor, the chances are that EPC contractor can bring in Korean ECA as a lender or as, a, as an insurance guarantee provider. To the extent that sometimes a more expensive EPC contractor could be chosen if he can bring in an ECA from the home country compared to a cheaper EPC, EPC contract without ECA involvement. That is how important ECAs have become and the way to bring them in is to appoint whatever contracts coming from that country. So with Mong Duong Tu, you see the off ticker is EVN, the electricity utility. The fuel supplier is the um, state-owned coal mining company, Vina Coleman. The EPC contractor is a Korean contractor. Okay, next we're going to look at the individual players in the transaction. And the first one is the lenders. The lenders would look very closely at a particular financial ratio, the debt equity ratio, meaning how much of that loan, uh, sorry, how much of the total capital investment into the project would be financed by debt and how much of it will be financed by equity that is put in by the project sponsors. From the sponsors perspective, they would like to raise as much debt as possible. Ideally, they put in 5% equity and then the rest could be financed by debt because they don't want as much of their money to be at stake. And also when you calculate the cost of capital, the higher the debt portion, the higher the returns are for the equity owners. So these days with project finance, you would see that the ballpark ratio is 70% debt, 30% equity, 70-30 or 75-25 around that range. Another term that you would come across is covenants. Covenants are conditions put into the loan documentation and these represent all the things that the project has to fulfill throughout the life of the loan. 
and with the implementation of the equator principles and IFC performance standards that govern project finance, you will see many environmental and social conditions or covenants being put in. So even though financial close is a very important mark in the transaction, even after financial close, as an NGO, there are still opportunities to challenge a project to make sure that it's implemented in the right way by looking at the environmental and social covenants to ensure they are met. And in the extreme event that those covenants are not met, it could trigger an event of default, meaning that the project developers can refuse to repay the loan. And that's why banks are really on the case when it comes to covenants. They want to make sure nothing would become so serious and so unresolved that it would trigger an event of the vote. Another thing that the lenders look very closely at is the power purchase agreement tariff. What the project developers expect to be paid when they build the, pro uh, the power plant. It's made up of five components. The most important component is capacity payment. Now, capacity payment is available as soon as the plant is ready for dispatch, regardless of whether the electricity is actually generated or used or evacuated into the grid. I build it, I made it available, I get paid. That's all. And sometimes this is also called take or pay arrangement because you either take it or you pay me. Either way, I get paid. Capacity payment alone is enough to repay debt and to provide an equity return to the sponsors. So in a way, all the other components is a bonus. Is you know, It's very good to have and the banks would like to have it and the sponsors would like to have it be paid, but these are costs that occur when you're actually running the plant. Capacity payment is paid when I made the plant available for dispatch. I may not even need to run it to get paid. It's a very important consideration for investors and for the banks. And we see that this sort of tariff structure very common in developing countries because is being put into the tariff to ensure security of supply so that investors will have the comfort in knowing, okay, the off-taker has agreed to pay me when I build the plant. I don't have to worry about anything else. And that would give the government the security of having enough electricity supply. But I think this particular model is really prime for reform. Next, we're going to look at export credit agencies. There are ECAs and then there are ECAs, many different types of ECAs. Export credit agency support can take many different forms. They provide loan. It could be a loan to the project directly, or it could be a loan to finance the um, purchase of a boiler for the coal-fired power plant. ECA also provides guarantees. It could be a guarantee to the commercial banks lending to the, to, the, to the project, or it could be guaranteeing the finance of any equipment to the project. And finally, ECA provides insurance covering many different types of risk. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this because it's actually instrumental for ECAs to provide risk insurance covering political and commercial risk for any coal-fired power plant to proceed these days. There are also ECAs with different mandates. So there is coal in France, there is oil Hermes in Germany. These state-sponsored ECAs have a limited mandate. It, they're not allowed to lend directly to the project or to buy equipment, but they are allowed to provide guarantees and insurance. 
and that stand in contrast to ECAs from the US, US Exim, or JBIG from Japan, or Korea Export Import Bank. They are allowed to do all three. They lend, they provide guarantee, they sell insurance. And that is why to pick the right ECA to be involved in the project finance transaction is important. If you have a choice to pick between a German ECA whose mandate is a little bit more limited and compared that with a Japanese ECA that is allowed to do all three, as a project developer, I'm going to think, shall we just pick a Japanese EPC contractor? That would make life easier, isn't it? Risk insurance. So I said that um, it's a very important product for coming from the ECAs in providing this. In fact, it's so instrumental. It is not an exaggeration to say that if ECAs are not involved in providing this risk cover, no coal fire power projects will proceed. And this is especially the case in countries that are developing and their sovereign rating may be a bit below optimal. There are different types of risk cover, political risk, commercial risk, and most importantly, extended political risk guarantee. Now, this risk guarantee, in short, EPRG, you may hear it quite a lot when you um, are analyzing project finance transactions. EPRG covers the usual political risk plus risk associated with any breach of contract by a government party. So for example, the off-ticker defaults, the ECA will step in. If the off-ticker, PLN, in Indonesia suddenly says five years down um, the road from the beginning of the power purchase agreement and it says to the project developer, I'm not going to honor the obligations in the PPA anymore and default. Then the ECA will be able to step in and say, don't worry, I'm going to cover that risk. And it's especially important in a country whereby the state-owned electricity utility and the country rating itself may be below investment grade or only one or two notches above investment grade. Banks would not lend to a project without this sort of cover. Another thing, just to illustrate this, is that for a large project finance loan, say for a billion dollars, you might have 800 million of that loan covered for 100% of the political risk and 90% of the commercial risk meaning that the ECA would provide insurance for that tranche, for that portion of the loan. It's not lending towards it, but it's covering the risk for that percentage, for that tranche of project finance. The rest, the 200 million, the project developer will have to go somewhere else to find another ECA to support it and cover it. And that's why it takes maybe two or three ECAs sometimes to cover the entirety of the project finance loan. Many of you may have already come across this. The OECD ECAs have come out since the beginning of this year, the guidelines on restricting coal-fired power financing. And the intention is to restrict financing from, for the dirtiest type of coal technology. So hoping that project developer would stop doing subcritical technology and move to supercritical or more ideally ultra supercritical. Because it's so new, the guidelines only became effective from the beginning of this year. The jury is still out. We don't know how effective it is in encouraging a genuine transition to a more efficient technology. Or it could be that the progress represented by the guidelines are so minimal that the transition would have happened anyway. Finally, we look at project sponsors. Project sponsors could be a single party or more likely is a consortium. You have a power developer, 
you have a fuel supplier, a coal mining company, and you have an EPC contractor. That's really the ideal composition of a consortium. That's what the government would like to see in the tender. They like everyone having a bit of skin in the game. And for the coal mining company, that's really a trend for them to go downstream into power generation. It makes money for the mine, and it allows them to um, secure a supply for the project. It, it's very logical for them to get involved. We've seen a lot of Chinese participants in the independent power producer market. Names such as China Shonghua Energy, the largest coal mining company by market cap, very active in Indonesia. And then there are power generators such as Kuadian, China Southern Power Grid, Power Construction Corporation of China. They've all been very active overseas. And then there are the top Japanese trading houses, Itochu, Mitsubishi, Mitsui. They are also familiar names for overseas power projects. However, we are starting to hear from these players that they are acutely aware of climate change risk and that they are on the radar of many NGOs. Missouri has been reported saying that they will cut its investment exposure to coal by a third within three years. Soldiers has also said something very similar. And for many of the Chinese power developers, Japanese trading houses, their domestic markets have shrunk. In China, the country has suspended a lot of the coal power plants in the pipeline. In Japan, in spite of the intention to build a fleet of coal-fired power plants, the plan is going very slowly. So we are starting to see that many of the power developers recognize themselves. They are in a sunset industry. It's really the trend is really downward, and they try to export their equipment for as long as they can. Before wrapping up, I just want to do a summary of learning to make sure that we do understand the basics. This is the project finance structure chart that I shown earlier, showing the chart for Mong Duong Tu in Vietnam, what the details are. Now, let's look at this table. We should be able to understand everything in this table now. For Mong Duong Tu, the financing package comes to $1.5 billion. Korean Export Import Bank is involved as a lender, lending directly $342 million. Now, the second tranche, the $280 million, is being lent by other commercial banks, or no, the Japanese, the international banks. And then Kazim has agreed to cover 100% of the political risk, 100% of the commercial risk for this tranche. Now, what do we do with the outstanding $839 million? For this tranche, or this portion of the loan, another ECA, also from Korea, K-Shore, they've come in and said, don't worry, we're going to cover 80% of the political and commercial risk. And that comes to almost 1.5 billion. There are a couple of smaller debt facilities that add up to 1.5. The tenor of this loan is 18 years. The debt equity ratio for this deal is 75% debt and 25% equity. So I hope that after going through the basics, you now all understand this table. And when you come across it, you'll be able to explain it. Thank you very much for the time. Um, this is the end of my presentation. Great. Uh, Jessica, back to you. Thank you, Yolanda. That was wonderful. Very insightful and thoughtful. We appreciate it. So, Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up now to any questions. I didn't receive any through um, the message chat, but if any of those of you who are attending right now have any questions for Yolanda, please feel free to unmute yourself and share them or to send them via chat. Okay. Oh, Yolanda, can... oh. oh. go ahead, Dan, is that you? Yeah, sure is. 
Okay, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Andre, for your presentation. This was really helpful. I, I didn't know much about project finance uh, or the intricacies before this. Um, I want to go to what you were saying about the transition to club deals um, as opposed to the underwriting and syndicating model. Um, you mentioned that project developers have to deal with more banks, which means there's more uh, legwork on there and to answer questions and, and satisfy the, the bank's checklist, um, and therefore it's harder to close the deal. But does that also mean that uh, the, the the project might be less vulnerable to banks backing out if they if they from the very get go have uh, a whole uh, club of banks that they're talking to. Interested in your thoughts on that? Thanks. Yeah, uh, not necessarily. Uh, just because a bank is in a club deal doesn't mean that it's less likely or more likely for them to stay on. Um, I think anything is ha is is possible before financial close. Um, and there are many issues that can crop up, land acquisition issues, permitting issues, air pollution issues, um, and illegal challenges. So anything that um, you can uh, convey to the project developer and to the banks before financial close uh, would give them cause for concern. And whether it's an underwriting model or to a club deal uh, is, is uh, less relevant. I think it could be... Uh, a material consideration if you are the underwriter. So if you are in the old model, you're underwriting the entire deal. So that means you're really holding the key to this client relationship and the client is relying solely on you. And that means the onus is so much greater for that bank not to pull out. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yolanda, we have another question for you, which is, can you explain what is better or worse about debt versus equity financing? Sure. So that really goes to the heart of you know, how to finance the debt equity ratio. If it is entirely debt finance, uh, well, okay, actually, let me step back. Infrastructure projects are very expensive to build. So it would be very unlikely for it to be solely equity financed that the project developers themselves put up billions of dollars to build a toll road or a coal-fired power plant. That's very unlikely. But when you are looking at the ratio and you are comparing what is better, is it debt better or equity better, usually from the sponsor's perspective, they want as little equity as possible even if they have the money to put in more equity. And that's because um, there, is a, there is a formula that the banks would use is uh, to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. is to calculate how much it costs to you as a bank in lending that money, because that money also costs money to have. And um, if you just follow that formula, uh, the higher the debt portion, the higher the return on equity it is for the sponsors. So from their perspective, I want only 5% equity or even less if the bank would have it. But from the bank's perspective, they'll be saying, no, 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 I don't want to take on all that risk. You have to really put in some money of your own. Um, also, in terms of um, the hierarchy of debt and equity, which one would have um, the privilege or the priority in assessing the project if anything, say, goes wrong? Debt would have priority over equity, and as a result, debt has a um, lower interest, uh, lower return compared to equity. So it really depends on who you're speaking to, whether it's the sponsors, or the banks? Does that answer your question? Great, thank you. Um, I also have a question. 
Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I understood more how Japanese uh, banks and trading houses are collaborating. Um, in your slide, you heard that uh, Mitsui and Sojitsu were expressing concern about investing coal power plants. Can you, um, is it in a, in a news or interview or is it somewhere written in the, in the policy? Um, are you talking about the thing I quoted about Mitsui? Yeah, yeah, Mitsui and Sojitsu. Yeah, it's um, in the press. I think, uh, in yeah. fact, is um, uh, media stories following the meeting they had with um, the Smith School from Oxford when they present the strand asset argument, and a number of them was interviewed after that press conference. Um, yeah, it's in the press. Okay, thank you. Yolanda, I have another question here for you. Sure. What's the relationship between the life of the asset? That is, the coal plant is supposed to run for 30 to 35 or 40 years versus the term of the financing. So the example you gave here was 18 years. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's right. A coal-fired power plant these days would have a lifespan of 30, even 40 years. And the duration of the loan, the tenor of the loan, is um, it could be 15 to 20 years, generally. Um, so it doesn't cover the entire uh, lifespan of the of the project, and it doesn't need to. As soon as um, the loan is repaid in full, and they can work it out uh, how much the project developers can repay every month, they are happy with the tenor. That's really. Um, uh, almost like a mortgage, you know, you, you just repay your house, you can live in your house for a lot longer after you repay the mortgage. And from the project developer's, pers developer's perspective, um, the revenue that they can generate and the profit they can earn after loan repayment is really a money spinner, it's a really good business for them. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to ask you, Londa? Yes, I do. This is Nancy, if that's okay, please. Yeah, absolutely. Sure, thanks. Thanks very much, Elon. This has been very helpful. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about sort of in broad terms. I've always wondered, like, if you took one coal plant and you followed it through its life, you know, it, one unit 40 years ago maybe cost $50 million and then we put all this, uh, you know, em environmental controls on it for $100 million and the utility writes off, I don't know, $80 million for it or I, I'm not sure, but I've always wondered how do all these numbers kind of stack up for an individual coal plant, if we step back or we look at the big picture and say, here's what the, you know, here's what the initial coal plant cost, here's how much we spent on interest, you know, here's how much they depreciated, that might be out of the scope of this, but it's something I've been wondering about for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think um, there are many variables when you are dealing with long lifespan infrastructure projects such as power and many things can happen and as I said in the beginning when you are first um, when you when you first approach a coal fire power plant and you're given all these numbers okay th this is the capital investment this is the fuel cost and this is the tariff how you're going to get paid and how much you're going to get paid but then eventually as regulations moved on as uh, technology has moved on as societal expectations have moved on suddenly 15 years later your plant is still running but then the government says no you need to put in a scrubber because I don't want too much sulfur SO2 socks and knocks in the air. So you have to actually put in new money and invest in the plant. That's one variable. 
And there are many things like this that crop up during the lifespan of a project like this. Um, and all these additional costs haven't been factored in in the beginning when you are financing your, uh, you know, when you are streamlining your financing package. So you're right, um, you can't actually take a snapshot of the project in the beginning and say this is going to, going to stay constant for the rest of the lifespan of the project. It's not. New things will crop up. More likely than not, it's going to impose additional costs to the power plant. And whether that means that the power plant would become stranded because it cannot continue to operate and continue earning revenue and you have to uh, even write it off or maybe you suffer a little bit as a project developer, you don't earn as much but the government has all sorts of subsidies still propping up the project. So you're very spot on. You can't just take one snapshot of a project and say this is it, this is going to stay constant for the next 30 years. Is that helpful, Nancy? Yes, it is. Thank you. And I, I've just been wondering, though, too, to get a little bit more into that. Is there, like, you know, let's take a coal plant like, you know, Navajo Generating Station or something that has been in the news a lot lately. Is there a general uh, principle, for example, that, you know, that utilities are able to write off far more than the initial cost of the plant? Or I've always wondered, you know, how much, how much, how much, you know, what's the ratio between what they can write off versus what the initial cost was? Um, not sure I'm being very clear, but to kind of get the big picture of a coal plant, because I know I was struck when I looked at some of these coal plants of how small the initial cost was compared to the total life cycle cost of the plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, actually there may not be, not, there isn't really a direct relationship between how much a project gets written off to the initial investment and the capital investment, what you put in to build the plant in the first place, you also have to add in the operation and maintenance cost, the fuel cost. Um, so that's why when you look at the um, tariff component, you have the capacity payment and the plant is also get also gets paid for all the variable components. You know, the more you generate, the longer you run the plant, the more you get paid. So when you are writing something off, you are basing that figure on how much you're foregoing. So it's more the ongoing cost rather than the initial capital investment. Thank you. It's a very good question. Thank you. Does anybody have any others? No? All right. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And Yolanda, thank you very much for your presentation. You obviously piqued the interest of everybody who's listening with their great questions. So thank you to all of you. We look forward to seeing you at the Energy Finance Training in New York in just a few weeks. Thank yes, you. Yes, I look forward to meeting all of you then. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.